and Zoom. So today we welcome Dr. Pedro Machado, and he's a researcher at the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences and a professor at Lisbon University. His main activity is focused on planetary sciences, more specifically on the study of the atmospheric dynamics of the planets in the solar system. He's invited scientists at the Japanese space mission Akatsuki, is part of the Venus Express science team at ESA, is co-PI of the Ariel space mission, co-PI of the main spec instruments on the Envision mission, and the Omega instruments on the Mars Express mission, both at ESA. So today he comes to talk to us about planetary atmospheres, a roadmap of planets that lost their habitability. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por la invitación de venir aquí a hablar con ustedes. Now we change to English. And uh, again, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to share a little bit of our research with you. And so um, I will start to speak about atmospheres and is where is based my research. And as you see here, the bodies with the square are the only bodies with uh, atmosphere in hydrostatic equilibrium in our solar system. Of course, that now there is a bridge from our knowledge uh, in the solar system and what we are still, uh, we still have a lot to learn, of course, and to share this knowledge and this synergy with the, this new adventure that uh, raised now then began now, that is, the characterization of exoplanets' atmospheres. So, I will uh, ask your attention for this, uh, this uh, table, and I want to pinpoint here to you, and I want to draw your attention for something here in this table. It's just a couple of numbers, just one, some of them. And, but before, I will give some context. If these planets, the rocky planets, the telluric planets as Mars and Earth and, and Venus, they form more or less at the same time. And from, I would say, the same building blocks from the planetary nebula. So I would say that the uh, evolution of the <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> primal planets must be quite similar. And I would expect that the atmospheres in the, begin, in the beginning, they were quite similar. And they evolved in such a different way. How come? Why? Let's see this, uh, this history and let's follow the water in this history, mostly. Not just, but mostly. And usually we, we used to say that, well, Mars is so different from Earth and Venus is so different from Earth. But I want to tackle this question in the other way around. Is the Earth that is quite different from the others? If not, I want to draw your attention for the relative composition. And you can see here that the relative composition on Mars, on Venus, and on Mars on CO2 is almost the same. And the nitrogen on Venus and Mars is almost the same. So what is different, in fact, is Earth. And as we will see, and as we'll see in the context, a little bit more specialized that we will uh, uh, <clears throat> In, in the following slides, uh, I would say that this is what I expected for the primordial atmospheres, that at least the relative composition was quite similar, as is still today, the rough approximation, of course, between Venus and Mars. So what happened to us to evolve in such a different way? It's, of course, the, what we will see in the, in the following right now. Perhaps most of you perhaps are thinking, yeah, but it's quite different to the, 
the, the atmosphere on Mars and Venus, of course. And they evolved in, a, in a, such a different way. And as you know, the super, superficial pressure on Venus today is like 22 bars. So it's like being one kilometer below the surface in the sea. So a soda can will smash with this pressure. And the, the pressure at the surface on Mars, as you well know, is less than 1% of our on Earth. So what, what, how come, why they evolve in such a different way? And also the superficial temperature is another thing that I want and we will discuss today is more than 460 degrees plum will melt at this surface temperature on Venus and on Mars very low. Well, so let's see what provoked this, this uh, utter different uh, cases in the temporal evolution between Venus and, and, uh, and Mars. And of course, based on the different, different case that is. So I know that everybody here know about that. That comes in the books for a long time. And you are specialized on this topic. So you know most of you better than me that, well, this with this collision with Taya, it's something that we all know. The new thing is the most uh, the new evidence about uh, from Bode et al. from 2019 in nature is that this impactor was in fact not a regular asteroid but the ocean world, based on isotopic ratios in the overage of isotopes, like molybdenum. And so the thing is that we have an apport of an extra amount of water that was immense on Earth. And of course, that, that will tackle a lot of different systems, as we will see on the problem. First, we will have an extra water and uh, water like oceans are like sponge for CO2 that we all know. But now we expect that the, that starts the main uh, difference in the temporal evolution of Earth. That was most of that CO2 that was grabbed by oceans in, in the first step. But there are other steps. And the other step is that we will have an extra amount of water in the crust. So, and this water will work as a lubricant. So it will be much easier to uh, layers to uh, move uh, between them. So it will be much easier. So less friction to have, click, 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 oh, sorry, not here, but yeah. So we'll have, uh, Less, less friction, and so we will have that uh, plate tectonics that will uh, remove this extra CO2 that was delivered for to the crust to beneath the, the subsurface, subsurface, bearing this extra CO2. If we go back to that uh, slide where I had this table with different numbers, the extra amount of atmospheric mass was, if you remember, mostly CO2. But if we bury the CO2 in the, beneath the surface, we will uh, we'll remove from the atmosphere a great deal of mass. So now it's easier to understand why in the temporal evolution between Venus and Earth, the <clears throat> the quantity of uh, atmospheric gases on Venus is much higher than on Earth, but because the initial conditions were similar, the mass of uh, uh, Earth and Venus is quite similar. As you know, we often call to Venus the evil twin of Earth. And now we understand one of the things that made the, this global difference in the temporal evolution. So we have the remotion 
that we removed a lot of a great deal of CO2 from the atmosphere on, on Venus due to this process on Earth. So Earth is the case that is utterly different from the other rocky planets. Another thing that I want to, <clears throat> to uh, go deeper, but I don't know yet, we will try to address these questions using the capabilities of the new space mission that is being prepared now and vision to, uh, to Venus. That is the interaction between the subsurface and the uh, lower layers of the atmosphere. Of course, the SO2 and the extra SO2, and the source of uh, the replenishment of SO2 on Venus, but also why it seems that on Venus, the internal heat is lower than on Earth. And of course, the volcanism being different, we already explained, is connected with water. I would say almost directly. Of course, the time being, this explanation is at a simple level, but I will start, as I said, as I said, yeah, in this simple level. Another thing that we must address to understand this uh, different temporal evolution of the atmospheres is magnetic fields. And I was speaking a lot about Venus, but let's give an eye to Mars. On Mars, the the atmosphere is much of much lower density than on Earth. That we know, but how come? Well, one thing is connected directly with the, <clears throat> the mass of the planet. But I would say that uh, that's not direct. And we have uh, a lot of evidence about higher density in the past on Mars with water at the surface, and we all know that. But let's give an eye about what produced this difference in the temporal evolution. And one thing is connected with magnetic field. Of course, you know that uh, the internal magnetic field on Venus is, there is no evidence. There is a induced magnetic field in the higher layers of the atmosphere, but not in the inner uh, magnetic field. How, how come? Very easy. Venus rotates very slow. So even one year uh, is, uh, the length of one year is <clears throat> shorter than one day. 2019, 219 to 243 days, more or less. So as you see, it's not effective, the rotation to produce by the dynamo effect, by Faraday law, uh, uh, important uh, magnet, internal magnetic field. That's one thing. But what happens with Mars? Because Mars rotates as Earth. By coincidence, one day on Mars is 24 hours. So this argument doesn't work. Of course not. But a, sm a, a, a roll bread will cool down much faster than a huge bread. I used to if I'm in Portugal, I would say a pão alentejano, a bread from Alentejo, it's a very big bread. Here, you please help me, what are the big breads in Spain? <laughs> so the thing is that the, this, this is thermal conductivity. So it means that the small roll of bread would cool down much faster than the big bread. So what I want to to the message that I want to pass with this very awkward example is that Mars lost its inner uh, uh, heat much faster than Earth. Even if by, for the dynamo effect, it rotates fast enough, as Earth at least, but the internal heat, it's not enough to have enough ions and charges to produce by the Faraday law, this magnetic field in a very effective way. So the loss of this magnetic field, perhaps in the past there were magnetic fields, even relevant magnetic fields on, on Mars. Yes, there are some tiny evidence on, on that, of course, that we must explore that better. But I would say that we will find for sure 
because laws of physics are always the same besides the gravity law that everyone knows that on Monday morning, the gravity law is much higher than the common, but uh, this is just a special case that happens on Mondays. Besides that, the, the laws of physics are essentially the same. So again, about what I was saying, so there was a deflection of most of Martian atmosphere group at time, with time, and as an outcome of this, we know by the, <clears throat> the uh, diagram of phases by for water due to the low pressure and low temperature at the surface, of course, connected with not quite effective uh, <clears throat> greenhouse effect today on, on Mars. It means that it's not possible to have at least for a long time water in liquid phase at surface. There are some in the ghoulies, as you know, on, on spring, there are some uh, drops of water uh, that arrives to the surface, mainly in the very steep uh, craters or, uh, or in the, in the, in the, the cracks. So besides that, the water at surface, well, in the liquid phase, because we left some in the ices in the winter uh, hemisphere, as, as you know. So this is a, mostly a context for what I want to, to share with you about our um, research. First, one thing that is connected with these rotations and the fast rotators that are on the, on the, on the right side for you, the Earth and Mars. So our uh, Coriolis acceleration is important. So we have the <clears throat> trade winds and rest and rest uh, and uh, Elysius. So the trade winds and westerlies. And uh, so this will uh, impact the kind of uh, dynamics on the atmosphere that we call the geostrophic equilibrium. On the other side, on Venus and Titan, that we will call the slow rotators, it means that the Coriolis acceleration will be not relevant. As outcome, the, the kind of equilibrium in the atmosphere is totally different. We call it the cyclostrophic balance between pressure factor, uh, pressure force, a gradient of force, and, and the gravitational force. So as a, 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 re a result, we will have zonal winds parallel to equator, as you see. And one thing that is not totally clarified today is this triggers the acceleration of the winds, these horizontal winds, called a phenomena of super rotation. For instance, on Venus, the atmosphere rotates more than 60 times faster than the solid globe. On Titan, that is also a slow rotator, is about 12 times faster than the solid globe, even so. So we use uh, ground-based observations and at the same time, uh, space-based observations uh, in, in a complementary approach in order to address the study. For this time, we will address mostly dynamics. And we use the fact that uh, we can use from the ground this uh, very high uh, spectral resolution in order to, we use the Doppler shift of the solar radiation backscattered in particles in suspension in the atmosphere. And with that, we retrieve from this Doppler shift, of course, removing a lot of spurious uh, other causes, uh, uh, other Doppler shifts that I will not address now. Uh, but we can retrieve winds, but in a competitive way, if we uh, compare with uh, the, for instance, cloud tracking from spacecraft, from space, uh, from orbiters. And from there, so this is one of the, the raw uh, data reduction that we do from the shallograms, so from the basic data till obtaining the uh, 1D spectra, but they are high resolution. So at the same time, we can produce dynamics and we saw hmm, 
we can go for isotopic ratios because we have extremely high spectral resolution and also study minor compounds. So th this will be the second part of this talk. So we start with dynamics and we saw we could take the most from our data, of course. And we this uh, too much equations before lunch, I would say, but this is very easy. What I want to show here is from the shift of just one line is impossible, impossible to retrieve uh, <clears throat> with, the, with the precision we need about five to 10 meters per second in precision, uh, the, the velocity of the winds, for instance. So what we do is, in fact, that is what is in this, uh, in this uh, system of equations here, we perform a wafer average using all the front offer lines, about 4,400 lines, all the shifts using as a, a wafing co coefficient the inverse of the variance related to each, each line. With all this statistic, we can measure the winds with an error that can go, for, for instance, with VLT Espresso with about one to two meters per second from ground based observations. That's incredible. So, at the same time, as I said, we perform uh, coordinated observations. This was in the past with, uh, <coughs> with Venice Express. Now we use Akatsuki in order to uh, perform this kind of, uh, of studies. But I will not take too much time on it here. Uh, the only thing that I want to share with you here that is in these observations, we were uh, observer, observing coordinated with IRTF Texas, with Teres and Hanna from Paris Observatory, in order to retrieve the SO2 in the presence of and variability of the SO2, the temporal and spatial variability of the SO2. And that was quite important at the time. So some basic stuff about uh, the atmosphere of Venus. I, I think that I will not go too deep on this. Most of the things that I want to pinpoint to you, I already said. So the rest, if there is any question, I will be happy to, to answer. So we also use uh, the cloud tracking from the space probes, for instance, to study the vortex that is highly uh, <clears throat> uh, variable on, on, on Venus at the time. And uh, from here, I want also to share that we have this uh, relevance of the studying the same dynamics from the space. And well, there are some tricky things, like for instance, that was the first hurricane on Venus detected in our observations. And with a Spanish friend and collaborator, Xavier Peralta. Uh, and what I want to say is in our observations, we started to detect a lot of atmospheric gravity waves. And this could be very important to trigger, to accelerate the, the horizontal layers of the atmosphere in this uh, phenomena of the super rotation of the atmosphere that we have evidence on, on Venus. So this is the basis of the cloud tracking. Of course, it moves with time, and uh, I will not go also in very deep on this, but we were interested in studying the, the atmospheric waves. These are planetary uh, uh, scale waves, the Y-shaped wave that for more than 60 years, we couldn't understand. And this is a caution, even if I totally 100% proto modeling. Modeling is very important, helps me a lot uh, in, uh, in our uh, observations. And so it's a win-win um, rela relation with modeling. So I support 100% modeling, but we must be careful. And one thing is why, and the basis of this work that is related with something that we, we departed from the model of, of Earth because Earth observers, they have the terabytes. Of course, that we have the extreme cases, but they have the terabytes. So we started from Earth's model and adapted to Venus. And we couldn't uh, 
uh, <clears throat> we couldn't model these Y-shaped waves. So what we did was to vanish everything we know and started from the scratch, from the primitive equations in from the basic equations and from the differential equations related with dynamics. And from there, we could, in our model, uh, nicely uh, predict the Y-shaped wave, as you can see. So now we use Akatsuki, and that is the only orbiter that is in the orbit of Venus at this time. And we were also interested in studying uh, planetary scales, planetary scale uh, waves, in this case in the uh, infrared, but from there we wanted to go deeper and to start to go study lower uh, layers of the atmosphere, like that case that you can see there, that is a huge disruption in the Venus atmosphere, like a huge uh, frontal surface on the atmosphere, like a wall in the that could be very important for chemistry and related to it, something that I will uh, dis discuss with you now about this case about phosphine on Venus. Do you believe in that? So let's address this on the following. And we started also to study the uh, mesoscale and minor, scale and minor uh, scale waves on, uh, on Venus and Mars using different techniques that we developed and fine-tuned and from that we started to first detect and second step characterize these waves now we even could uh, uh, develop now it was last month a method to measure the uh, with precision the altitude of the waves on mars because on venus was very easy that was easy because we are on the shoulders of giants that studied that before, of course, but on Mars was not easy at all, but now we can do it. So that's very important to characterize the uh, atmospheric gravity waves on Mars. And we can do it that today? Yes, we can. And of course, related with model, always related with model with LMD on uh, <clears throat> on the models from France, but also with models from Japan. So we are in close connection and collaboration with these two groups in, or, in order to uh, fine tune and connect the synergy between observations and modeling. And so as what I'm saying, that is very important, but I want to go directly to the main things that I want to, to, to share with you. So, this is related, this slide is related. Oops. With uh, Envision. And Envision, because Venus is totally shrouded by clouds of sulfuric acid, it's difficult to map the surface and study the relation between the surface and the, uh, the atmosphere and the replenishment, as I said, of the SO2. But also, are there volcans on Venus? Are they active? We are addressing that now. We are, and we are doing this study in a twofold approach. First, uh, looking to uh, thermographic maps of the surface and to look for hotspots. The first study was made with Virtish, an instrument on Venus Express. Now we are uh readdressing reanalyzing this data from all the all the mission but also uh, one thing that is important is uh the uh, minor minor gases like ceo like hcn and other important cases related to it you with astrobiology and we are in the process of detection but it's not easy, so uh, I hope that we can do it before the launch of, uh, of Envision, otherwise <laughs> we must wait a, a lot from the launch, but we are doing some work on that right now. And we already had some positive uh, 
detections of some minor uh, compounds on the atmosphere of, Ven of Venus, but uh, well, let's see in the paper that will come out hopefully in the next month. So now on Mars, you know about Ocean Borealis, of course, and that with time that Mars lost most of its water. Were there life on Mars? We don't know. There are, there is life on Mars today, it's possible. And we want to participate and collaborate in this huge task that is to perform this kind of investigation. It's, I would say, a marvelous adventure to look for this. And we, what are we doing? We are, uh, in one way, we are characterizing uh, ocean, ocean, old shorelines and also fluvial marine systems on, on, on Mars, but not just at a topographic uh, level approach, but also uh, using uh, OMG instruments from Mars Express. Uh, we, and using reflectance, we want to study the characterization of the minerals connected with these fluvial marine systems on Mars. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, in our small team, we have connection with ExoMars TGO, also a nomad instrument, but also uh, with Mars Express, mostly Omega instrument, uh, that is an image spectrometer, but also with the high resolution camera HRSC. And with Omega, what we want to, to, to do on Mars, we are doing already, is the characterization of the, the atmospheric gravity waves, but also about the methane, I will show you in a couple of slides. So that is the basic. So you know that there is enough water on, on Mars, we know. And on, on the, I already said about the surface, so I will skip this. But for instance, Mars Express detected huge reservo reservoirs of water underneath the surface. Uh, and there are recent evidence of uh, water near equator and this is very important this is very important that we add water because time is important for life and if we add water in the equatorial region for a longer time mostly in the basins in, in some craters like g0 and others that are now on full st study as you know that could be very interesting uh, so one thing that uh, affects very much the climate on on Venus on Mars, sorry, is the dust storm that could be global. And this one thing that uh, myself I'm studying with the same technique of the Doppler velocity. So measure winds on Mars is very difficult, really difficult, because it's so tenuous the atmosphere. But along even a regional dust storm with this technique, we proved that we can retrieve and map the winds on Mars seen from Earth using this ground-based observation. So this is more or less the same technique, but here I have the terms of the spurious contributions of the Doppler, but I will skip this. And again, in more detail, what kind of course that we must deproject from line of sight that is, is data reduction. So I think that if there is any question, of course, I can go uh, in detail share with you what you ask, but if not, let's speak now about where I can, because I'm very interested in collaborating with you, because you know much better about what I do know, that is the biological uh, and more chemical related with life thing. So I, I watched well my, my years to hear from you and the kind of uh, uh, research you do, you do in this beautiful, uh, research center, and to see if we can envisage uh, some line of complementarity where we can be useful for you, for instance. So speaking about phosphine, why phosphine is so important? Phosphine, we know that in, there are tons of phosphine on Jupiter and Saturn, that we know, even gives that uh, reddish color on Jupiter. We are not just phosphine, but phosphorus compounds, the chromophores. However, 
phosphine in rocky planets that we know there is no other way of producing phosphine than our bellies. So all of us, we have, we are very rich on this because all of us, we have a lot of phosphine on us. So phosphine could be used as a biomarker. Of course, I'm in direct collaboration with Clara Sosa Silva. She was from MIT. Uh, she was a brilliant scientist. Now she's in Harvard. And she's called Dr. Phosphine. She's a specialist in, in this uh, uh, molecule. And the thing is that kid could be useful for biomarker. And if we learn not to do that on the solar system, even for uh, the exoplanets one day with uh, the ELT and Andes, who knows? We can find phosphine in a rocky planet, exoplanet. Well, first we must disentangle from, I, I often hear in the news, uh, Earth-like exoplanet, and I'm always with uh, Urtikari. I, I'm always not very comfortable with that. I, I prefer to say the Venus-like, because Earth is very special. So the size, we can say size of the Earth, Earth type uh, for me is a bit too much. Venus is more normal, I would say. Earth is very special. So again, phosphine is very important because of this in the rocky planets. We don't know other way of uh, forming phosphine besides that uh, uh, very strange and weird thing called life. So, and was proved that no volcanism, no other sorts of, no lightning, no. It's not possible to form phosphine. We can produce in an industrial way, of course, but life is prone to produce this. So this was the first detection from Greaves from Alma. And there, there is a lot of controversy about that, as you know. And Teresa Canad, that we work in a close collaboration from uh, using data in other parts of the spectrum, not on this, as you can see, a bit in a other a spectral uh, signature. And there is no phosphine. I don't believe. But we gained three missions to Venus. So here, what I want to uh, show you is our uh, um, trial to support, support the uh, detection of phosphine on, on Venus. But as you can see in this, our previous and we performed dedicated observations in different regions of the spectrum, and there was always a no-go. That's a pity. But we'll have other, other corpses, other bodies on the solar system to study, like Enceladus, that is a brilliant case, or Europa, Ganymedes. But no-go, as you saw. On the other hand, on Mars, there is the detection of uh, methane from uh, Mars Express. There were others from the rovers, as you know, but there are also a lot of things to study about that because for instance, there was a no-go related to ExoMars CGO related with the, the study of, let's see, of, of methane on Mars. So we don't know, it's highly variable. It's special and temporal variable the emission of methane in my opinion that fits if it's underneath microbial life it's possible if it's serpentinization as you know better than me it's one it's one way that we can collaborate with you that we are trying to develop a method to disentangle if the the detected methane will come from uh, a biological source or from a geological process. From the olivine, uh, you know, uh, much better than you. But we can, we are trying to develop and fine tune this method. So 
we'll be open to discussion about that in the near future. Um, so meta in as possible be, be signatures. I think that is in this house, is no point to discuss this with you because you know much better than me about that. Of course, that methane, because it doesn't remain for a long time in the atmosphere because it's, it's fertilized by UV. So we need a, 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 a source of replenishment of methane. And on Earth, it is in the case that we know better, life is, uh, <clears throat> is the best uh, option to, to explain that even New Zealand now, we have a tax from the government related to its release of methane from cattle. I will not go in, de in details because we are going to have lunch after. So let's move, move on. And from here, another thing that I'm quite interested is to, to perform uh, compared planetology. You already saw this in between the lines on what I said till now. I, I love to study and compare the temporal evolutions of different planets. And I have this synergy with the exoplanets we are, even I'm coordinating a, a working group from Ariel Space Mission related exactly on this. The synergy between the study of atmosphere in the solar system and exoplanets. So this new adventure that is the current that is starting to be possible to characterize from now with Expresso and, and other, and James Webb, of course, the, to, to characterize the, <clears throat> the exoplanet atmosphere. So uh, we started to perform these studies on deuterium and, and hydrogen uh, uh, overage ratios. And we studied that on Mars. We also studied on Venus. And this is very important to study the evolution and who knows related with the methane and the compounds on the methane. I think that I have a slide of a study that we are doing right now in this moment uh, about Titan and methane on Titan because there are a lot of open questions of methane on, on um, and the sources of methane on Titan as you know. So, uh, Again, this is one of the uh, studies that we are performing now and to, to, to use the isotopic ratios in order to study, tem study temporal evolutions and comparing with Earth, as you see there. And another thing is about, I already uh, told you about that, that we are performing this kind of uh, exercise, that is the research of volcanic plumes on Venus. Are there volcanic plumes today? There are shield volcanoes active on Venus today. We are looking for, we are performing connected with modeling. We use PSG as a first approach, approach entire spectral generator from NASA, from Geron and Villanueva, but also we use Nemesis from Patrick Irwin from Oxford. And we have this collaboration in order to have always modeling, supporting and helping us to compare and to predict observations with uh, the observations that we do or that we have access. And we are in one way uh, preparing the advent of the, this new mission. So I'm connected with this uh, uh, instrument, VENSPEC on board uh, Envision that is in preparation now. But I would say that Mars, a, a little bit against all odds, it seems that there, there are new evidence about some volcanic, perhaps too strong, but some geologic activity. I think that is awesome because with that we have extra energy. And if we have extra energy and all the compounds and, the, uh, <clears throat> and methane and so, well, I think that you'll have a lot of work. So, right? <laughs> so we'll have a lot of work for the next decades. So another thing that I also already pinpointed is uh, about Titan and searching for some components of astrobiological interest. And here we have 
again, some uh, study about methane and the isotopes of methane related again with the fact that we can use extremely high spectral resolution. So we can detect the isotopes in our observations. Of course, here the connection with laboratories will be mandatory, and so we'll need help on this. Or we can be, on the other hand, helpful for you on this. So it's a win-win situation. Let's see if something will uh, ignites from, uh, from these ideas. That's one thing. Another thing that we, that we are doing is, and I'm almost in the end, is looking for this very interesting molecule or molecules based on C3 molecules on Titan. This is something very, very interesting for you and for us, of course. And we are developing, it's not fine-tuned yet, so please give us a little bit of time to fine-tune our methods because it's the, uh, <clears throat> the, the quantities are very, very low. So I will just move to the end and about Ariel that I already spoke about and the synergy between what we do in the solar system and, uh, and the synergy that could be very helpful for studying and characterizing. And one thing that we do is during the last transit of Venus, there you see this aureole here. This is the unique case of passing at, uh, light from the sun, from the star, from the atmosphere, so I have interacts with the atmosphere, so we have uh, we can have this uh, opportunity of performing uh, <clears throat> uh, transmission spectroscopy on the solar system. So because we can retrieve some um, observables on the atmosphere, and we can compare with the other ways of measuring the same observables on Venus. So that's the only way I would say to have a template for transmission spectroscopy to share with our colleagues that's from the exoplanet studies. And this is a case where the solar system could be of utter relevance in this synergy. Again, we are doing that as, as we speak. It's almost done, paper shortly, I hope. And another thing is studying Earth from abroad, from abroad, from very far. So when Rosetta looked back to Earth, to look as to Earth as Earth was an exoplanet, like a point source. Of course, we must integrate a little bit. And we, I'm speaking about spectral N members. So the fingerprint of the presence of oceans, of clouds, of deserts. So it's done for us with our, it's a, a work led by our colleague Fabrizio Oliva and paper also shortly about this scene looking at Earth as an exoplanet. What we are doing, we just finished to do the same for Mars about presence of ices, of clouds, or clouds very difficult, and about deserts. And next step will be the other bodies of the solar system where we have a lot of uh, data sets. So, we, we will be eager to contribute to disentangle these kind of exoplanets. Are they this terrible furnace as Venus, a real incinerator, or they will be almost a still a paradise as Earth? And I will be very happy if we can participate and contribute for this process in disentangling between these two kinds of same size, almost same size, uh, planets. So that I will not go in detail, so I will just skip his transmission spectroscopy and phase curve spectroscopy with Ariel. So it's the kind of uh, uh, research that we will be uh, will be able to do with the data um, that Ariel will uh, will gather. And I already said where we can compare and where we compare this is from Giovanna Tinetti that she's the PI of uh, Ariel space mission and Celsius in Darwin proposal about the 
important spectral regions from CO2 on Mars, on Venus, and on Earth, and where we can look for the markings important in the exoplanets regions of the spectra that could be relevant to uh, have the evidence of the presence of certain uh, compounds. Mainly, I would say chemical compounds that are in disequilibrium because they are in disequilibrium. Something is pushing the disequilibrium, like CO, HCM, and whatever, this important uh, more oxygen, of course. Of course, that we look for ozone, of course. But oxygen is what we want to look for. So there are uh, a plethora of habitable exoplanets already, but of course, this is the beginning of a new adventure, an adventure that will be for all of us. So there are wonderful times that we live, at least on science. So thank you so much. Of course, if you have questions. Comments. Thank you so much, Pedro, for this very interesting and informative talk. So now, if we have any questions here. Thank you very much for, for your talk. I have a question regarding the, the Venus atmosphere. It seems to me, I don't, I don't know an expert, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that uh, it's not homogeneous. Is that right? Which... The, the atmosphere of Venus is not homogeneous. You know, in the, the vertical column, vertically, uh -huh. vertically, of course not. Even if we go uh, near the surface, the temperature is so high in the no, pressure. But, but I mean the, 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 the most dense layer of the atmosphere that I guess this is very dense because it has a lot of um, uh, water and, and particle, whatever. I mean that, the, well, the question is, is the entire uh, composition um, completely mixed mixed uh, in the atmosphere or th there are big uh, regions of the atmosphere where this, uh, let's say, less uh, dynamic and all the composition, you know, is more stable because I, I guess one explanation for, for, the, for, the, for the phosphine, for example, mystery is that you might have some regions of the atmosphere that are producing, let's say, let's imagine that something is producing, but it disappears. And it's only in those specific regions where these, uh, these things can happen. Is that possible or is just I see, an I think that, <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, is it very important what you, the question you, you posed? And I tend to agree that that's a possibility. So, for instance, if we look to Mars about the methane, it's clear that the regions in one part and the other, the, the spatial variability is very relevant, very much relevant on Mars. That could uh, happen on, on Venus? Yes, it can happen. And uh, uh, more than uh, I want to tell you that of, about the layers near the surface, we don't have much information. We have the venera probes that uh, very rapidly crossed, and we have uh, some data, but it's very, very low. And also we have the CO2 that is in the critical uh, uh, phase near the surface, so it's very difficult to study. But the, when we go a little bit up, even be, below the, the, the lower cl uh, clouds on, on I mean, that's about 45, 48 kilometers. Even there, we we see that there is a huge variability for instance, the SO2. And when we go higher, so to the layers where the phosphine was claimed to, to, to appear, it's true that for instance, the SO2, even the SO2, we call it a dynamical tracer because it's not homogeneous at all. And so the maps, if you are interested in this, the maps of the SO2 distribution a long time from uh, Teresa and Kana from Paris Observatory, she uh, show us that it's uh, uh, the mapping of the CO2, CO2 depends on, on, on the position we are, but also with, with the time. So 
which was thing that could happen something like that. We had this idea. You remember that uh, it's, it's nice that you posed that question because if you remember, I, I spoke about this kind of wall, this big disruption on uh, um, on the uh, the atmosphere of uh, of Venus. Uh, uh, work from Xavier Peralta from Spain and uh, me and other colleagues, of course. And this works like a real wall. And so because we have superrotation, some chemical compounds that are much lower on the on the atmosphere can, with the superrotation, they can uh, eat the, this wall and come the eye. And so we were, that was our idea for the next observations, dedicated observations. To see, we want to follow as long as we can the disruption in order that if we see a phosphine on the top, and that could be connected with your question, yes. That's bringing me to, to my mind the, the, the connection with the uh, plate tectonics. So, because I don't know if perhaps to, to uh, adventure to say that, but could be or could be some phenomena in the in the Mars sorry in the Venus atmosphere that somehow resemble the 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 plate tectonics in the sense that big masses of atmosphere move together and you, you know uh, um, make contact to the others and you know That's I don't know if this is possible or not just imagine it. I don't know but I love your idea look to uh, the atmosphere because it's so dense at a kind of uh, soft matter, but there is the same principles of the, the crust. Till a certain point is what I was saying about the phosphine that would climb, or even we can have other molecules that can come down. I don't, I don't see why not. So as I said, even if this is in the core of our idea for a proposal, uh, for observing proposal in order to come again with Clara Sousa Silva and uh, the other group in order to see if we, there are some phosphine. Of course, it was, if we have luck enough to see, to detect phosphine, that was really something that was uh, a joy, but that's it. So I have a question about that. So would that mean that you would have a biosphere on, this, on the atmosphere, you know, of Venus? Yeah, could. it's claimed sometimes like that because. And sorry, could have that first have originated on the ground when the sun was fainter, and maybe there was some uh, rocky material and some liquid material that you you could have the biosphere there, and then it would go to the atmosphere and have all that sinking and the material. Um, how do you say, material? Recirculation and maybe well, could could be could be, and uh, what you said in fact is something that we discuss a lot exactly about kind of biosphere on Venus because it's true that is the incinerator near the surface with the six hundred forty uh, degrees Celsius that melts the bomb as I said, but when we go to the cloud tops. The pressure is one, one bar, and the temperatures are between 10 and 25 degrees Celsius. So it's like on Earth. So, and as we know, life could be very resilient. We see that on Earth with the extremophilus nearby in the Rio Tinto. And so you know better than much better than me about that. So uh, if life ignited some, somehow on Venus, perhaps could find their way to manage to survive. We don't know. And it's, of course, I, I would say a very important line of research. And the, the possibility of remaining on the top of the clouds, uh, there are some studies in modeling about that, that uh, say that is possible, that could be. Uh, and the fact that life and uh, water that there were water on the surface of Venus from the past, but uh, Venus lost most of its, its water on a similar process. It went to the higher layers of the atmosphere, was fertilized, and uh, even today, 
in the in, in the orbit of Venus, there is a torus, so molecules that are being lost with time, and there is still hydrogen and oxygen in the proportion of two to one. So even today, Venus is losing the final remaining of water till today. So it's possible. I would say that is totally possible, yes. And we must study that. Thank you. Any other question here? We'll go first here and then. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, my question is more related to the D over H, the deuterium uh, ratio that you see in, um, I think it was in Venus's atmosphere and in Titan's atmosphere, that it is enhanced, no, with respect to Earth's. Uh, uh, on Mars. Uh, oh, sorry, on Mars, okay. But we are also studying the same on Venus and Titan. All right. So I was wondering what is this, um, this deuterium enhancement coming from? Why is it enhanced on Mars with respect to Earth? And is that related to the initial conditions of the formation of the solar system? That's a very good question. We don't, I don't have a nice answer to give to you. We must work harder because this is recent uh, uh, evidence. So now we, in the observational approach, we reach these results and now we must go deeper and of course, that the Teresa and Kana results were a bit, there are, I think it was 2019. And we already discussed a little bit. So we have some ideas, but we, we, we are not sure about that. So what I think is must be related with initial conditions, as you said, must be. But a preferential loss of certain uh, of certain molecules could be, but we need to discuss <laughs> and to learn with people that know more than us about yeah. that. I mean, that would be very nice because in principle you could connect um, the composition of these planets, atmospheres, with the initial conditions or, or in the process of star formation. That's potentially very, very cool. <laughs> and then it's a way to go. It's exactly what I want to study, as I said, with temporal evolution of the planets and to compare the, the, the planets. We know that the geology of Mars is a little bit different from us. Venus and, and Earth are much more alike, but Venus, we have much more mafic, rich in magnesium rocks, so the geology and so must be different. So we must have a different mi mindset to, to look to Mars. So I think that the initial conditions will play a very important role there, for sure. But we must see in detail and interact with other researchers. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering um, if uh, it could be any relationship between the presence of phosphine and the, this mysterious UV absorber on the atmosphere of Venus. And what could it be, this UV absorber? I mean, could it be life? Could it be some kind of compound? What could it be? Thank you. So you know about the UV absorber, very good. <laughs> this is a, still a mystery, as you know. Uh, we don't know yet. There are several uh, educated guesses, let's say. I would say, in my opinion, that is just my opinion, must be a compound of, uh, of sulfur. However, I already, so I, I work with uh, Yong Jo Lee from uh, Taiwan, and she was also in the Akatsuki space mission, and she was quite dedicated to trying to find this UV absorber. And she is near these uh, uh, sulfur compounds. However, it's not closed at all. I already, I already heard about that possibility of the connection of this UV absorber is connected to it live, and that in, in one shot, we could connect, it, connect this with the absorption of the UV and the presence of phosphine, and even as was uh, 
uh, said before, uh, we could have uh, a variability along the atmosphere. For instance, life on Earth is totally variable, so could be connected with this. It's, I think it's a, a nice idea and uh, that we also must address, but we don't know much about that. I'm quite ne uh, near some groups that uh, um, are trying to find this uh, UV absorber. It's very important for us to understand the chemical chains at these levels. And this is still a very important open question. Another is the SO2 replenishment, but this is uh, different because it's in the uh, lower layers of the atmosphere. So it was nice if it was true. <laughs> it's, it's a nice idea. So let's see what, uh, what we'll do in the, in the following <laughs> as together. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions here? Yes. Uh, Maria, I don't know. let me see on Zoom if there is any question. Hi, Rita. No, there are no more questions in the chat. So no questions on Zoom? No. So no. I guess that's it. Thank you so much, Pedro Machado, for coming here. And it's a big pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure a lot of collaborations will emerge. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Happy Friday, everyone.